And you say hi, baby. Say hello. Like it doesn't have matching hoodies. You're adorable. Thank you, baby bean. It was this little one's birthday last week, and we got matching hoodies, didn't we? Because you're ten now, my little gorgeous girly girl. My little ten-year-old. I love you. I love you so much. Mm. Mwah, my baby. So, today's video. We can talk about it? Yeah, we are. Good girl. There you go, you get comfy. Jordan Peterson wrote a poetry book. Yes, that Jordan Peterson. <sighs> it's a lot, isn't it, baby? Yes. This is Jordan's book. Would you like a sniff? I know, right? An ABC of Childhood Tragedy, Volume 1, implying there's going to be a Volume 2. I know. Basically, this is a poetry book that attempts to make light of child abuse. It's every bit as awful as it sounds. It really is. It's disturbing, it's badly written, it's in very poor taste, and I don't understand who the target audience for this book could possibly be. I don't understand who reads this and thinks, yeah, this is the way I want to spend my time. So we're going to be taking a look at this book in depth today. Isn't that right, Grumble Pig? So to start with, uh, there are many things wrong with this book. Many. To give you a very, very brief summary, this book is a series of poems, one for each letter of the alphabet accompanied by an illustration which is basically just a photograph with like a high pass filter over it, lots of detail brought out, um, and a vintage scratchy filter put over the top. When I first looked at this book I was like okay well the illustrations are well done if a little tasteless, but the longer I spend looking at this the more I'm like actually it's an effect that's very easy to achieve, not especially complicated, and honestly you know? Each poem in the collection tells a different story of a child who has been abused, raped or sometimes killed by the people, usually adults, in their lives. Can you believe I'm saying these words? I can't. Now the subject matter of this book is bad enough and we will be talking about that in depth in a little while, but I just briefly want to start by talking about the quality of the writing in this book because it's bad. It's really, really bad. I think it's an insult to poetry to call these little written doodles poetry. Peterson clearly has absolutely no understanding of poetry on a technical or emotional level or artistic, you're right, you're right, I forgot that one. He just seems to think he can throw a little bit of alliteration at a page, throw in a few half rhymes, hit enter a couple of times and call it a poem. What we're left with are poorly written poems with confusing concepts, a lot of repetition, complex vocab just for the sake of wanting to sound smart rather than it's because the most appropriate word, awkward rhythm which makes the poems difficult to read aloud, there's been absolutely no thought put into the meter at all, there's no punctuation in this book which again makes it rather difficult to read and follow, he's chosen to end lines where there's a rhyme rather than where it makes sense and where there's an impact, his syntax is abhorrent, a lot of these poems are just like clauses thrown together with no connecting words and it's confusing and it's weird and just like it's horrible to read, not only because of the subject matter but because of how poorly it's written. I wonder did an editor work on this and if so how did they let half of this stuff go to print? The book also lacks any consistency throughout it, clearly he's trying to go for something similar with each one of these poems but there's things that just like mess it up, like each poem is four lines except the last one which is five for literally no reason. Each poem has a different rhyme scheme, again not for any good reason or purpose but clearly because Peterson was just struggling to maintain the same one for each poem so he mixed things up wherever he wanted to without, I was gonna say without any rhyme or reason, but you know, without, without any good reason. It's clear to me that he probably spent about half an hour writing this book, so it's a quick cash grab rather than anything else. There's literally no understanding of poetic technique displayed anywhere in this book. If I had to give you an example of one of the very worst in the book, it would be this. Polly had a pretty doll that she pushed inside a trolley. A strange intruder pinched her doll and used it to ensure her fall. That's exactly what I was thinking. So any semblance of rhyme scheme is just thrown out in those last two lines. It doesn't make sense, it doesn't fit with any of the other patterns of rhyme scheme in the book. The plot, if you can call it that, the narrative, the point of the poem makes very little sense. I don't really understand what the point of this one was. I'm unsure if this is meant to be like an homage to the kids poem that starts with Miss Polly had a doll who was sick, sick, sick. 
I don't know if it's meant to be a, an homage to that or if Peterson just lacks any originality or creative thought. I'm inclined to think it's the latter based on the rest of this book. Take another example where the syntax is confused and makes no sense. Yvette yawked and yearned while her parents spurned. The love she could have offered them went instead to many men. So you have this thing where it's like while her parents spurned the love she could have offered them and the love she could have offered them went to many men. Like It's a weird thing. It doesn't fit as one full sentence but because there's no punctuation, we don't quite know what it's how it's supposed to be read. It's like these two sentences have been crushed together as one in a way that doesn't make sense with no connecting words. It just, it's awkward, it's poorly written. But the other problem I have with this is that it's also slut-shaming an abused child. Like, is he serious? Peterson's point here is her parents didn't pay her enough attention so she was sad and slept with lots of men. But let's remember this is a child, so any sex was absolutely statutory rape. Are you okay? I know it's a difficult topic, I know. You're doing great, baby. You're doing great. So one, this is absolutely shaming anyone who has multiple partners. Some people just enjoy sex. That's okay. It doesn't have to be a trauma response. Some people just like it and that's all there is to it. There's no need to shame people for that. Two, are we forgetting this book is about children? This character is a child. So you're saying she was repeatedly raped because her parents didn't love her enough and that's somehow like the punchline to this? You're trying to make a point with this? You're trying to be like, ha ha, isn't this humorous? Because that's what this is. This book is marketed as like witty comedy. And three, what is with all the victim blame in here? He makes it sound like the child is the one in the wrong for one, complaining that her parents didn't love her, using words like yawped and yearned to make it seem like she's the needy one. She's asking too much. Oh, you know, she's just the annoying child who's moaning all the time. It makes her seem like she's the one with a problem because she has sex with many men when no, She's a child, therefore it's statutory rape. These men are raping her, that's what this is. There's lots of admonishment of her actions, but none of the parents or the statutory rapists here. Why not? Should we get you a little biscuit? You can lie down, yeah? Come on then, let's do that. All right, that's the beast fed. She's got a little veggie chew. Really cute, they're these like dried veggie chew chews that are in the shape of animals and they're really hard and crunchy so they're good for her teeth as well while she's chewing them and she just enjoys them so much. She loves it. But in his promo for this book, Peterson described this as being similar to the likes of Neil Gaiman, The Nightmare Before Christmas and Edward Gorey. I wrote these poems, it's 26 poems, one for each letter of the alphabet. I wrote these poems when I was doing a lot of clinical work and seeing the sorts of terrible things that happened within people's families and I suppose in some sense it was an attempt to blow off some steam. Well, so these are a bit Brothers Grimm-like, I suppose. Pretty brutal. Terribly comical. If you like The Nightmare Before Christmas, if you like Edward Gorey and his Victorian catastrophes in poetic form, then maybe you'll like the ABC of Childhood Tragedy. Ha! Happy reading, folks! I thoroughly disagree. I really, really do. This comparison is delusional and a little offensive. He could not come close to their creativity or talent if he tried. Nothing in this book sparks the same joy as, like, the work of Gaiman or Gory or any of those slightly dark, gothic, but still, you know, fun works. You know, I think he compares it to Coraline at one point. Coraline is genius. I love both the book and the film. It's amazing. This doesn't even come close. This book isn't even worthy of wiping Coraline's bum. Gory, I'd say, is probably the closest in comparison. And in fact, when I first picked this up, my first thought was, ah, it's a poor attempt at a Gory ripoff. The comparison goes as far as that this is an ABC diary, or as some people call it an ABC darium, a style of book of which Gory wrote quite a few. And his books were also about some dark topics. They also had, I guess, bad things happening to children at times, but that's as far as the comparison goes. That's where it ends. Edward Gory was basically a creative genius. He was an artist, an illustrator, a writer. He designed costumes, he designed sets for plays and films. He worked on all sorts of other amazing projects. And when I say he wrote books, that's kind of an understatement. He made art pieces. He was an artist at heart. He was amazing. He made these small matchbook sized books. He made pop-up books. He made illustrated books. All sorts of really, really creative projects that push the boundaries of what people kind of took for granted and saw as normal at the time. His books and work weren't necessarily easy to sell, but they were little works of art in themselves. They were amazing. Works of surrealist, abstract, insane, nonsense art. They were 
brilliant. And sure, the subject matter of plenty of them is intended to be dark. In perhaps his most f famous ABC diary, The Gashly Crumb Tiny, each letter of the alphabet tells the story of a child meeting a dark ending along with an accompanying illustration. Sure, child death isn't a fun or light subject at all, but the punchline in this book, or the point of this book, is never to be like, haha, the child died. The humour and the creativity of it and the surrealism comes from the subversion of genre conventions. Gory's books feel dark in the same way that the original fairy tales were dark. They're meant to be surreal, they're meant to be difficult to read, they're meant to be cautionary tales, they're meant to be subverting expectations and genre conventions like I said. You expect the Victorian setting of a lot of his books to be kind of prim and proper, but in reality it was a time when there was poor health care, poor sanitation, child labour was common, and so kids did struggle and his books kind of present the realities of that time rather than a perfect idealised version. The typical ABC diary for kids, you expect to see cute illustrations with rhyming couplets and you know the subject have to be happy and cheerful, not child death with these black and white ink illustrations. So you're taking the genre conventions and subverting them. That said, there still remains a degree of separation from reality with Gory's work, with the fantasy-like settings, the theatres, ballets, hotels in the middle of snowy fields, the absurd situations, the art with exaggerated features and expressions. It never quite feels as close to reality as something like this book does. This feels like it's taking the reality and laughing at it. Gory feels like he's taking a small bit of reality and exaggerating it and making something fictional and creative and wild and fun with it and pushing all the boundaries that he can do creatively. So take the Gashly Crumb Tinies as an example. ABC series were traditionally made for children to teach them the letters of the alphabet get them into reading, get them starting to understand letters and the sounds of letters, phonetics, getting them to understand alliteration, that sort of thing. Think of your typical A is for apple, B is for bed, that sort of thing. The more complex ones would sometimes feature cute children or characters going on adventures. I know my favourite as a kid was uh, Top and Toby, which I read over and over and over again. And it's about this little boy and his dog who go on an adventure to explore the alphabet. And at each letter they come across different people and characters and things happening or they interact with the letters in some way so you know one example of a page is C was curved and covered with crows top climbed it Toby chased the crows notice the typical genre conventions here cute colorful illustrations lots of alliteration simple language and sentence structure a light-hearted and fun story in comparison the Gashly Crumb Tinies completely subverts this instead it takes the things we usually see in the genre rhyming couplets cute animals fun scenarios adorable illustrations and tilts them on their head completely the cuddly bears you'd see in children's books turn into B is for Basil assaulted by bears. The fun sleigh ride in the snow turns into D is for Desmond, thrown out of a sleigh. And the bright, bold, cute illustrations are replaced with these stark black and white pen and ink drawings. I feel like the point of this book is for adults to look at it and enjoy the subversion of expectations and have a giggle at the absurdity of the situations that normally get presented in children's books as being like, you know, fun and exciting. But then also, to have this kind of bittersweet element where you're a little bit sad about, you know, the realities of what childhood could have been, but then f also feel safe and removed by the absurdity of the situations. Does that make sense? These have roots in something dark and realistic, like kids living in poverty, for example, but the absurdity of the situations is exaggerated, so it doesn't feel exactly like reality. It takes that little bit of darkness away from it by adding these surreal and exaggerated elements. For example, the little boy devoured by mice. Do we really think that's likely to happen? No. But then again, there are other tales that are fairly realistic, which are meant to be a little more cautionary. For example, I is for Ida who drowned in a lake, and J is for James who took lie by mistake. I'll say it again, the humour here doesn't come from ha ha ha, kids are dead, but comes from this subversion of expectations of the genre. It comes from the shock, the darkness, the cautionary messages, the unexpected situations, the surrealism, the exaggeration. Peterson's book doesn't capture any of this. It uses in the illustrations photos of real children, so it feels a little too close to home. It feels a little too real. You don't get that surrealist separation. Instead, it just feels like a dark reality being mocked. So take, for example, this illustration of a child crying accompanied by this 
poem. Cynthia constantly crabbed and cried, and then one day just up and died. Her family all sympathised, but felt relieved so deep inside. The image itself just makes me uncomfortable here. Where is the artistic merit of a picture of a crying child with a vintage filter thrown over the top? It doesn't make me feel anything other than uncomfortable. And I don't know if that was necessarily the intention for me to feel this kind of uncomfortable. Do you know what I mean? Especially when the intended meaning behind this poem is Ew, kids cry too much. Oh well, at least now she's dead, she's quiet. I can't see what's enjoyable about any of that, to be honest. And the thing is, like I say, there's nothing absurd or surreal about the situations in this book. The punchlines are real traumas that damage people for life. They're not cautionary tales because most of the poems are about, yep, these adults will abuse you, get over it kids. I feel like throughout the book, Peterson has real contempt for kids and it just feels really icky. Like with Gory, you could tell that even though as an individual he said that he didn't really understand kids or enjoy being around them, um, like in his personal life, you could tell he was never necessarily intolerant of them, he didn't dislike them, he wasn't derisive of them, he never made it seem like the kids deserved what happened to them or that he was happy about his deaths. I can't say the same for this book. In this book it's almost like Peterson is getting glee from seeing what is happening to these children. He's like, ha, 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 isn't it funny, this child was raped. <laughs> Go on, have a laugh with me about it. So let's look at another example. The Willowdale Handcar was written in 1962 by Edward Gorey, and in this story, three people, not children but adults in this case, travel on a railroad handcar and pass a whole bunch of sometimes dark situations and landmarks and all sorts. You know, they visit a vinegar factory, a cemetery, a burning house. They even rescue a child who's got themselves in a bit of a pickle. And this is part of like an ongoing story that's happening in the background of the story that we're being told about, you know? There's this implication that one of their friends got pregnant, fled and had a baby and left it there for someone to find and then these adults find it and take it to an orphanage and then later they save their friend from a suicide attempt and it's like a whole thing. None of this is explicitly said in the text but through the writing and the illustrations it's sort of left open to interpretation which is the clever part and we see this thing happening. These people who we think are the focus of the story kind of aren't really and they end up interacting with all sorts of people on their adventure both directly and indirectly and they make an impact on people's lives and on the world around them even when they don't necessarily realize that that's what they do in, they're doing they don't necessarily realize the consequences of their actions or the causes of what they're experiencing and that's a really interesting way to look at things and that's what I think makes this story so fun and so interesting to read over and over and over. The story ends with the three adults entering a tunnel and not coming out of the other side and we're left to wonder what happened to them? Did they live? Did they die? Did they turn around? Did they stay in the tunnel? Who knows? There's a lot of tragedy in this story and it's mostly happening to the people around them. We see the consequences of trauma and how it affects people but the people experiencing the trauma are never ever blamed for what's happening to them. It presents trauma and grief and hard times as just another part of life that we all work together to get through and help each other through and experience. This is completely different from how Peterson presents trauma in this book. He also presents it as inevitable, but in the way of trauma's gonna happen to you and you'll probably die, not in the way that Gory does it, of, Trauma is just another thing to get through so you can enjoy life, you know? Peterson tends to present trauma in a way that like, it's inevitable because we're all awful people and we deserve it. Kids get hurt because they deserve it, because they're too stupid or ugly or annoying to get away or they don't deserve to get away because they're a little brat. Take this example, which I think is probably one of the most disgusting ones in the book and it really, really bothered me. Isaiah embodied idiocy, but he hoped that he'd get free from the priest's kind buggery, though his corpse could hardly flee. Let's ignore the awful, awkward rhyme and lack of meter in this and focus on the message. A child is too stupid to escape, so he gets repeatedly raped by a priest until he dies. Excuse me if I don't see the humour in this. I read this and I don't see comedy, I don't see wit, I don't see dark humour, I only see victim blaming cruelty. Or there's this one in which a child gets beaten to death by his uncle. Quincy's querulous quibbling and his constant shivering forced his uncle's delivering the blow that quelled his quivering. I don't see the humour, I don't see the point, I don't see what's enjoyable about this. You're literally saying, oh, well, the child forced the abuser to do this. He, he didn't want to, but you know, this kid was just so annoying and quivering and shivering that the uncle just had to beat and kill him. 
Let's take another comparison with Gori's work and look at the Chinese obelisks. In this short story, an author goes on a walk and each stage is told with a letter. So it's another abc dery you know? A was an author who went for a walk, B was a boar who engaged him in talk. And throughout the story, he has a series of interactions and adventures until he's eventually killed by an urn falling on his head. Surprising, ironic, and dark. But there are also so many moments and interactions in this story which give you a little giggle throughout. Like, one of my favourite parts is this. I was an infant who clung to his sleeve. J was the jam he gave it to leave. <laughs> this kid just comes out of nowhere, is annoying and distracting as many children are, and this man has to bribe him with something ridiculous like jam to get him to leave him alone. It's like one of these silly little, oh god, yeah, kids are, kids are like that, aren't they, moments. The illustrations are cute and silly. The fact the child is referred to as it shows just how little this man, like, cares about the child and wants him there, so he didn't even bother to notice a gender. And it's not in a way that's necessarily dehumanizing, it's more in a way where, like, you can just picture this, like, bright little kid being like, give me attention, give me attention, and then this grumpy old man being like, grumble, grumble, just, just take this sweet stuff and leave, like, kids like sugar, right? You know what I mean? It's, it's a humorous situation in that sense. It's silly and it's a little ridiculous, and the humour comes from this absurd twisting of a familiar situation where, you know, in this case, the adult doesn't know how to interact with a child and he's really awkward and he's kind of weird about it, he's a bit of a grumpy guts, you know? That's what's funny about it. Compare this to the poems in Peterson's book, which are all just dark, but with none of the humour or absurdity. I don't think, haha, this child was raped, is a good punchline or something to give you a giggle, you know? There's one, well I say there's one, there's many really scary uh, poems about child rape in this book. We've already looked at one. Here's another one. Una's uncle came undone, and when he'd had his fill of fun, nothing but a single piece remained of darling little niece. I find it interesting that Gory can literally call a child an it in his stories and still be more humanizing and kind and compassionate than Peterson, who is apparently trained as a psychologist. Uh, we get another example of child rape in this earlier piece, which is... Oh, and there's a little side offering of homophobia in here as well, so enjoy that. Dick was a damaged little boy whose prancing father made him coy. When he ended up in jail, all competed for his tail. So the implication here is the father is a gay man and obviously all gay men rape their sons, according to Peterson. And then the kid ends up in jail eventually for whatever reason, probably as a result of all the trauma he's faced and blah, blah, blah. And there he gets repeatedly raped again. Lovely. How comedic and witty. Not all the poems are quite this dark though. Yes, uh, there are a number of poems about children being raped, a number about children dying and being beaten and bullied and murdering each other and all that stuff. Um, one poem in particular stands out to me as being not quite like the others, and that is poem K. K is a poem about Katie, a girl whose only crime is having bad skin and therefore being ugly. That's the abuse she suffers, being ugly. Katie's hair was kind of curly and her teeth were kind of pearly, but her skin was kind of gnarly and she remained an ugly girly. And then there's a picture of a really completely normal, quite pretty looking child. This doesn't surprise me from Peterson, to be honest. This idea that the worst thing a woman or girl can be in his eyes is ugly is not a surprise to me. It's misogynistic like he is, it makes me uncomfortable, I don't like it. Um, I also noticed, weirdly on this note, there's far more abused girls than boys in this book. Something like 16 or 17 abused girls as opposed to like 9 or 10 boys. He even managed to turn kids' names like Theo into being girls. It seems like he just wanted more female victims for whatever reason. I don't know why, it's a little icky to me. I understand I could be reading too much into things with this, but I just can't help but see it as another sign of Peterson's probably subconscious misogyny. He also has this weird habit of changing letters to fit with the page theme. So notice how on this one he spelled curly with a K. On this page he spells EX words with just an X. I don't know why he decided to do this, it makes very little sense to me, especially as he clearly wasn't all that dedicated to the alliteration thing in every poem. Just look at this poem for the E's, where there's no E words on the page except the kid's name. So clearly he wasn't that bothered about alliteration, but it, I don't know, it makes no sense. Again, no consistency, no real forethought. When I first picked up this book, 
and was making notes on it, I asked myself a few questions about what I want to try and answer with this video. The main one was, is this book inspired by Edward Gorey? Is it an homage to his work? Is it a parody of his work? Or is it just a poorly written ripoff? And now I think I can safely conclude that it is almost definitely the latter. Parody and homage require an understanding of the original work or genre, which Peterson just clearly lacks. This book offers absolutely nothing of value to the average reader and perhaps is only enjoyable to people who possess absolutely no empathy towards children or other humans. Covering child abuse in poems is by no means a bad thing at all. Um, I have a couple of poems which address the topic in my own book, Reflections on Healing. Some of my favourite poets in the world have covered the topic with compassion and rawness and sometimes humour. But in my opinion, Peterson's approach to this is vile, disrespectful, and ultimately offensive. My biggest questions coming out of reading this book and doing this review are, why did Peterson write this? Who is his intended audience? If you're someone who enjoys this book, are you okay? Who the hell allowed this to be published? And how does Peterson still have a career? Um, I'd honestly love to hear what you think of it, and if you can answer these questions yourself in the comments, please do. Um, I want to very quickly note that I did buy this book secondhand because I don't want to give Peterson any money, but seriously, this book is $30 new. $30? Who the hell is paying that, Kyra? Who the hell is paying that? Who? I don't know. Do you know how many balls we could buy with that money? How many steaks we could buy? Yeah. I know, I know. If you'd like to read a hopefully much better poetry book, or at least one which considerably more work went into, then I'd just like to take this moment at the end of the video to shamelessly promote my own poetry collection, which is available on Amazon now. It's a short pamphlet of 17 poems and original photographs by me about reflecting back on my own life and experiences through the lens of healing and being healed and hopefully helping to heal others. It's something I'm really, really proud of and that I worked for a really long time on and while it's my first collection and it's definitely one where I'm still finding my voice and figuring things out, um, it's something that, like I say, I'm really proud of and I hope other people will get a lot out of. So um, yeah, that's where I'm going to end things today. Thank you for watching. Please let me know what you think of this absolute waste of paper. <laughs> what you think of this book. I don't know if I can even call this a poetry book, but honestly, if it is, it's one of the worst ones I've ever read. It's kind of disgusting. It's very disgusting. And uh, that's about all I have to say on it, isn't it? Yes. All right, miss. Would you like to go on a walkie now? Yeah? Should we go out for a play and a walk? You good girl. You've been amazing through this. I love you. All right, for now, thank you for watching today. Thank you from us. Thank you for being so patient while I've been filming, little miss. I love you. And we'll both see you again very, very soon. Thanks a lot. Boop. Can I have a kiss? Thank you. <laughs> love you, Bean Bean. Come on, you. Walkie time. Walkie, walkie, walkie time. Go on, gorgeous girl. Go on.